Thanks for thanks for coming in. Uh, so uh, my name is Kurt Opsall. I am uh, deputy executive director and general counsel with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, and uh, my co-panelists uh, introduce themselves. Uh, you go first, DJ. All right. My name is DJ Mayo. I'm an attorney here in Atlanta. Uh, I do business and intellectual property law uh, and uh, litigation. So. I have, uh, I have dealt with defamation lawsuits on both sides, and uh, yeah, that's it. It's early. <laughs> okay, I'm Katech. Uh, I'm a technology journalist and writer for uh, torrentfreak.com, and I'm also an occasional contributor to Tech Dirt uh, over the last uh, three, four years. Um, so my experience of how the suits affected the, the company somewhat. And uh, and what that's meant for the journalist side of things. All right, yeah, and so uh, I should say that uh, uh, my organization, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, also is very friendly with uh, Tech Dirt, and in fact, we're giving an award to Mike Masnick in a week um, two yeah, weeks. couple weeks. Yeah, uh, the Pioneer Award. So. Um, you might imagine this is this is going to be a, a relatively sympathetic panel <laughs> for for the tech dirt side of things, uh, but we'll we'll, uh, uh, we'll try and present it as best as as, as we can. And so as litigious for you, uh, steering clear of litigious. That's that's right. Um, so that the, the uh, you you were going to sum up some of the some of the the factual history. Okay. Yeah. Um, Okay. In a in a nutshell. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I got my sum total of notes here, which is the guy's name. Um, the guy's name at the center of this lawsuit is a guy called Shiva Ayadurai. I think it's Ayadurai. Um, he's Indian born. Came to the states with his parents, aged four. Um, and essentially, his claim is that he invented email at the uh, University College of New Jersey School of Dentistry, where his mother worked at the age of 14 in 1978. The problem is, he didn't, according to pretty much every objective fact there is, and when Tector wrote about this, he got upset and sued. Thus the suit. Um, he claims, Ayadurai, I or Shiva, I'm talking Shiva for the sake of my tongue and sanity, um, Shiva uh, claims that he wrote this system, which was the first e electronic mail system or email system in the world in 1978 for this school of dentistry, and that it was groundbreaking and unique in that it was the first one to replace or emulate inter-office physical mail with to, from, CC, BCC, subject, etc. Um, the problem is many of these titles and subjects had occurred in a uh, RFC, and don't ask me the name because it's 10 a.m. on a Sunday, uh, but an RFC about three years earlier. Um, the other problem with his claim is that in 15, 20 years ago, he claimed he wrote it not in 1978, but in 1980. In his book, in some books and things, and his proof is that he got a copyright for the word for a program called email in 1982. Uh, what he calls email is not technically what we'd call email. It's a single system user, and uh, it, it's a sorry, it's a single database system that can be accessed by multiple computers across a, a local area network, and. Um, he has based a lot of his uh, career over the last 20 or 30 years on this claim of him having invented email and that people are denying him his claim because they're racist against Indians. Uh, despite one of the RFC, RFC re re request for comment authors being Indian himself. So that's the case in a nutshell as far as the, the, the facts go. Uh, his claim was largely unfollowed. He, his work was based on nobody else's really, and nobody else built off it or was even aware of it until 
he started pushing his claims in the late 90s I think and so he was a, an isolated blip that was bypassed and uh, was of limited or no use in the development of email itself except he would like recognition um, and he has uh, been steadfast in his desire for recognition when one of the, cr the creators of recognized creators of email, Ray Tomlinson was that Ray Tomlinson? I think uh, died a year or two back uh, he started a smear ca campaign saying that uh, Tomlinson didn't invent email, he did and was very nasty to a lot of press who covered Tomlinson's death kept trying to correct the record and uh, if you're here for our alternate facts thing you'd recognize the, the gist of what he was trying to do there um, so that's the facts as they are for how the case came about all right um and let me add, add a few other other things about so uh on the litigation uh side of things uh so uh he, uh, Shiva filed a suit against uh, first Gawker, uh, and he was represented by the same attorney who was representing Hulk Hogan in his lawsuit against Gawker. Um, and then it was settled with Gawker as part of <coughs> that same uh, settlement uh, with the H Hulk Hogan suit. So it was sort of a, a, a package deal for Gawker, and I was just looking that up, but you got something in the order of... Yes, okay. A fair amount of mon money out of that, uh, something that could help sustain uh, perhaps future lawsuits. Uh, and then uh, went after uh, uh, Tech Dirt. So uh, wh one thing sort of is, is, is notable is that uh, Gawker was pretty much crushed by the... Uh, that the Hulk Hogan lawsuit uh, and relatively ran, ran out of business um, and uh, the tech dirt was very concerned that this would, would happen to, to them as well uh, and this sort of raises one uh, issue that we can, we can go into some more, more detail about uh, but the, the, the challenges that are faced by a company that is facing a, a lawsuit uh, that uh, if it if it goes badly for them, will put them out of business, and the cost of defending it could be a lot. And if the if the person on the other side has resources, in the case initially of like of the Hulk Hogan versus Gawker suit, that was Peter Thiel who had lots and lots of money to bankroll that, to bankroll Hulk Hogan. Um, and then uh, in the case uh, against Textert, uh, we know at least there was like seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to help. Uh, uh, defray some of those future costs and there might maybe other other resources as well um, and so anyway, they filed, filed a suit against uh, uh, tech dirt uh, tech dirt is is defending itself uh, of course and uh, uh, they are moved to dismiss the lawsuit saying that it uh, did not uh, uh, state a claim because what they were doing was an expressing an opinion uh, and they also uh, said that this uh, lawsuit was a slap suit a strategic lawsuit against public participation um, and a uh, there are a number of states uh, um, in which there are anti-slap laws which means that uh, you can try to address this problem of the expensive uh, and difficult lawsuit by naming it a slap, convincing the, the, the judge that it's a slap, and then getting out of the suit much earlier than you ordinarily would. So that is sort of the, uh, at least in, in many states, the legal response to the problem of people overwhelming you with a, uh, a defamation lawsuit. Um, and so Tech Dirt has, has done that as well. Um, and uh, I believe that Georgia is a state here that has an anti-slap law. Most, most states do. Although most of them are very weak um, so and limited in, sco in scope. So. Yes. This, this is true. Do you know much about the, the Georgia one? Can you uh, I don't know the Georgia one. I'm talking about no, I actually don't. Um, well, so I, I don't know that the Georgia one in in particular, um, but they they started out with it about 
environmental lawsuits. So this was a problem uh, you know, a couple of decades back. The, the environmental movement was getting sued every time they complained about a, a, a company uh, and they didn't have the resources to defend themselves. And so a number of the anti slap laws were about uh, actually restricted to environmental issues. People started to look at it more broadly. Usually they are restricted to uh, uh, some sort of free expression, free speech end of things. Uh, and that's the, sort of the broadest end of it. Sometimes it's when you are doing something which is uh, petitioning the government for uh, redress of your grievances, um, which covers a, a, a fair medium sized, and sometimes it's very narrow. Um, I. In any event, uh, uh, Tector was sued in uh, in Massachusetts, uh, and they are arguing that under choice of law provisions, uh, California's anti-slap law should apply. Tector is based in California, uh, and they have some some decent uh, uh, arguments why the California, uh, which is a really good anti-slap law, should apply. The, the real <coughs> the real issue and it really does come down to the resources is that the challenge of these motions to dismiss or motions to dismiss under the anti slap laws which are two separate motions that dirt has filed both um, you still have to file the motions you're still defending yourself the, the, the downside to defending litigation is that it still takes time and expense um, there there's there's probably been some significant, significant legal fees already incurred by by Tector just in filing the motions that are that are on record. It's certainly less than if they have to go all the way through the trial, but it's not it's not free, and that is that is the chilling effect that litigation can have because people will settle rather than trying to defend themselves. People will not make comments um, that might get them sued if they see what happens. You know, if you if you see Gawker gets taken down and then they sue Tech Dirt and, well, you know what? I'm going to be a little cautious about what I'm going to say about the inventor of email who clearly invented email because he invented email. And I'm not going to say he didn't because he might sue me and I don't want to defend it. So there's a there's a chilling effect to both the the the, the public comment and the press coverage. And that is the biggest challenge to litigation: is that even when you're right, it's expensive. Oh yeah, and we've done. I've done um, a set of copyright troll lawsuits, and they can be really expensive to defend. And that's the whole point of copyright troll lawsuits. Mm -hmm. And indeed, patent troll lawsuits. It costs money, so it's cheaper to settle. So it's it's easy money. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so this this is the, that was the impetus behind the, uh, the the slap lawsuit uh, one other sort of like interesting challenge with the with, with defamation uh, so there, there's, there's a couple of ways you can defend against a, uh, a defamation claim uh, one is uh, that you told the truth yeah it's a, the truth is a defense um, and another would be that uh, the statement you made is a matter of opinion uh, it can not capable of being proven true or false um, and uh, therefore, it cannot be defamation. So, uh, and these seem to be uh, relatively straightforward. But the problem is, you know, that uh, is he's not the inventor of email. Is that a statement of, of fact or or truth? Like he would say, well, I did invent a program called email. We got a copyright registration for it. It sent some messages around. Factually, I invented email, and uh, therefore, if you say something different, that is a false and defamatory lie. And then uh, Tech Dirt is saying uh, that well, we, we no one's disputing that you wrote down some code, called it email, got a copyright registration. We're just disputing that that is the email that everybody thinks of as email today. And I that it was and, first. Uh, and well, that there are other things that came before that that had the characteristics of email, and so it is our opinion that what the thing that we concede as factually you invented is not 
properly thought of as email, and so this is a constitutionally protected opinion, not a fact that can be uh, uh, proven true or false in, in the same way. Uh, and so that's that's a big part of the dispute, whether or not it is a, it is a fact or, or an opinion. An important thing to tie that into the uh, cost of lawsuit issue is that a uh, you can file a motion to dismiss, have a brief, argue before a judge, and get to the answer about whether it is opinion, and if it is opinion, you're out of the lawsuit within, you know, months of uh, the lawsuit filing with notable but not crippling expenses. Uh, and that's the stages where, where they are at now. If you are determining whether a fact is true, this, this involves a jury and a trial and doing some depositions and discovery and all of a sudden your costs go up way high. So uh, uh, the difference between getting out early because it is a uh, opinion or having to prove that something is true, even if it is in fact true, uh, is is huge in the uh, the cost of things. And one of the one of the issues that 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 comes up again, just as part of the realities of litigation, um, is motions to dismiss are very 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 hard to be successful on. Um, it, it is as long as you can state a claim that on its face makes sense. In many many states follow the federal rules, and the federal rules uh, say that you know as long as I've stated a claim, I, I might not be able to prove it, but if I've stated a claim, my claim won't be dismissed. You then have to go to another motion stage called summary judgment and prove that I don't have a claim. So a motion to dismiss can be a very high hurdle, and the 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 reality is. Judges don't like to make decisions that might get overturned. Judges don't like to be the ones who are making that call in many cases. They like to be able to point to a jury and say, well, the jury said it, so, you know, that's what happened. Are you saying judges are cowards? No, no, it's just it's a situation where, where if, you, if I come to a judge with a motion to dismiss and, oh. I, say, and, I, and I say, this is not, th th this, is, this is factually not true. Yeah. Okay. This is a the, the a truth is a defense, and and this is a true statement. Uh, he he did not invent email. The judge is then the one who's if he agrees with me, he's essentially making the determination that this is not a this is yeah. this is a true statement. Yeah, coward, coward was a bad choice of word. Um, more sort of afraid to be stuck but, on the yeah. I mean, cautious. I think we should actually cautious. Even focus on the, yeah, on yeah, the fear. Yeah, and the yeah, yeah. There there are some reasons why we want facts to be determined right. by by a jury. Yeah. Um, or, or or even if not, I mean the truth the, the, the truth is the reason a motion to dismiss is much cheaper than litigation is because you get in there before discovery. You get in there before, you know, laying out the facts, taking depositions, getting testimony. So the judge is making his determination based solely on the plaintiff's brief the defendant's brief and maybe some lawyer arguments, none of which are actually evidenced of anything. It's just it's just argument, and so and so judges will often say, "Let's let this go to litigation. Let's get some let's get some discovery. Let's get some facts, and then we can know what the true what the truth is." So it, it's not to say that in this case, because this is the kind of case that a motion to dismiss might be successful in, but but in general. Motions to dismiss are a very, very difficult thing to 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 be successful at, and because of that, it, it it's instead of saving you the expense of litigation, it's just another expense on top of the litigation you're already going to end up doing anyway, because you probably won't be successful. Uh, well, so uh, do do anybody have any questions? Hang on, we have the the box. All right. How did they end up going from Thiel and Hulk to this guy against against Tector? And uh, the the how I guess is a, you know they got to take it up with them. <laughs> uh, the 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 timing of it was interesting. Is that uh, you know uh, as has been alleged, Thiel was bank bankrolling the lawsuit Hulk Hogan versus. 
uh, uh, Gawker, and then uh, the same attorney represented another person who had a, a claim against Gawker um, during that same time period. I don't know if Teal was also bankrolling that that effort or or not. Uh, it is interesting that the same uh, same attorney during the same time frame and it was settled at the same time. Uh, as the package deal, one case was then associated with the other in the term, in basically in the settlement of it. Um, but uh, so um, uh, I think, as has been suggested, uh, at least uh, that that uh, Teal was upset with Gawker uh, with some of the coverage they've had about him. Uh, but uh, I didn't uh, either either want to sue over that or feel that he had a good suit o over that, but in any event, didn't, but instead found this uh, uh, other uh, method and okay, uh, succeeded. Okay. I don't think what he was upset about was, uh, I believe he's upset about the fact that um, Go uh, Gorka outed him as, as, as gay, and so that he was upset about that because he... Um, he wasn't public about that, and um, it's not. That's not really something you can really say about too much. It, um, she, so she, so the guy, just the attorney. Yeah, just it, it, Men, yeah. The, the attorney and the, and the practice of the lawsuit and the timing. So it's kind of it's it's kind of like a parallel construction sort of thing. So it's, it's in the thing, and and he was looking for. She was been trying to find somebody to to sue for these sorts of things, and when Gorka wrote this thing about no, he's not the email creator, then that. You know, he's. I should also no note, by the way, just in the interest of fairness, that uh, Mr. Shiva, or Vas Shiva, as he's sometimes known, is also running for Senate next year in Massachusetts against Elizabeth Warren. And to give you a uh, a idea of his um, his position on on that, just so you get a, a better idea of his personality and his his thought processes, um, he's a, a fervent Trump supporter. Calls himself uh, a real American, but also at the same time says that people should vote for him so that it's a real Indian to beat a fake Indian. Uh, so that that's his sort of tagline. But I bet he'll campaign. have a hell of an email campaign. <laughs> yeah, but only if you're in the one doctor's <laughs> office. Uh, all right. Uh, next uh, next question. <laughs> So I had a question about the motion to dismiss. If you're not allowed to present factual evidence, then what really is the like basis of that? Like, how does that actually come about to be something that can really be dismissed? Or, well, um, or you, okay. you you can you can present some factual evidence, but the factual evidence, again, I, I'm I don't know the Massachusetts rules, uh, but the. The general rule, the, the federal rule, the, the rule that most states adopt and, and, and build off of, is that you can only look to what's actually in the complaint. You take everything in the complaint as true, or the pleadings. So, you, so if you have answers, or you, but so you take everything that's in the pleadings as true, and you say, if this is true, then, then even, even if this is true, you can't state a claim. Even if this is true, it is not a, a, a defamatory statement because it's an opinion, even if this is true. It, 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 and so there's, there's, there's that. The other thing is you can, you can present evidence, but under most rules, if you present evidence outside of the pleadings, it converts it to a motion for summary judgment, which makes it a different standard. So it's a, it, it's a slightly different process there. But again, that, that's why they're a difficult thing to, to come to because judges would rather have actual facts rather than assuming sentences are true and then basing a, law, a, a decision on that. To, to, uh, maybe just uh, to make an, a, an example to, to go through that. So let's say uh, I called somebody a spineless jerk. How and dare you? I know, right? <laughs> and then they sued saying that this was defamation and they said this was absolutely untrue. Here's a you know x-ray showing I have a spine. And uh, therefore, you have made a false uh, statement, uh, and then uh, I might move to dismiss to say that uh, my statement that you are a spineless jerk uh, is an expression of opinion that the the term spineless in this context was not to reference that you did not in fact have a spine, but rather you were acting in a cowardly uh, uh, manner using you know lack of backbone metaphorically. 
And then the, the judge could say, you know, that, that does, in context, I look at this statement, it does seem that you are not actually making a factual statement. We do not need to go through a, uh, a fact process to determine whether it's true. The man had no spine. But uh, uh, therefore, it is a, we can determine that this is a statement of opinion, and therefore, uh, I'm going dis to dismiss the lawsuit. I'd also like to know if you'll now accept service on behalf of my client, Katesh. <laughs> uh, and then I just want to also bring the slap uh, back into it. Uh, so um, under at least the California anti-slap law, which is the one that uh, uh, they are trying to apply in the Tech Dirt case, it allows you to actually require the person suing to uh, uh, put up their, their case a bit more, to, to put up the evidence that they have in order to, uh, to prove the case uh, if there is to be a, a factual uh, question. So this accelerates things a little bit. Um, though in, in, in this particular case, it, it is the tech dirt's uh, position is that it's, it's not about a factual dispute. That, uh, that they are not saying, everyone agrees that, that factually he wrote this program and factually he called an email and, and so on, uh, but that uh, it, it, is, it is the opinion about what all those facts mean that is uh, under dispute, while uh, uh, Shiva's side is saying that uh, it is factual uh, and that, you know, uh, that they, they should have a fact determination of what, you know, bring in some expert witnesses and determine what, you know, email is, and then uh, uh, that and this is, this is, uh, will be proven that, in fact, he did invent email as he sees it. And there was a hearing uh, a couple of months ago, uh, and uh, uh, the, the judge was, uh, uh, by and large, just let the, the sides do their arguments. Um, and But the one question that, that he, he brought and, and was asking the, uh, the attorneys was about um, what is email and, and why is it isn't uh, what email is uh, a, a question of opinion. So that at least seems to be on the, on the judge's mind uh, as well. And that, that sort of goes to the heart of the what is email because that is the heart of Shiva's case as well as that this email is this very tightly narrowly constructed thing that matches his ex um, description and his uh, let's 80, 82, 78 program exactly and that and only that is email and all the rest that came after it is a, a derivative of it. A variation based upon his great and underappreciated work. The, the, the interesting thing about, about a defamation suit is that it's a, r it's a risky thing for a plaintiff to bring because, you know, if it's, determined, if it's determined that it's not a defamatory statement because whether or not you invented email is an opinion, um, then we can still be of different opinions about whether I invented email or not. But if, 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 if Shiva goes through the efforts to attempt to prove factually that the facts are rock solid and, and certain that he is the one true inventor of email and is found wrong, <laughs> then then his entire you know, then there is a, a judicial finding that he is not the inventor of email. So whether it's an opinion or not is, is something that we can continue to dispute and, and and he can continue to carry on um, with his public career of claiming to be the inventor of email and selling books and public speaking as the inventor of email but if the if the judge or jury actually gets to the point of a factual determination that he is not then that's a real harm to his branch so there's there's risk to this on on his part now, I think he probably doesn't appreciate that because I think he believes wholeheartedly that he's the inventor of email and will be vindicated but but I think that that is a a very big risk to the plaintiff that he might end up with a finding against him that is far more detrimental to his brand than the tech dirt article ever was and I, I also just I guess to be uh, as, as fair as possible to to the to the other side um, what I think it, there's there's a lot going on here in, in, the, in Gawker and, and in, uh, on, on 
Detector and a lot of other articles which have been, you know, I mean, not only are they, are they saying that, that he, what he invented is not actually you know, the email we know today, but also uh, holding him to, to task for, for going out and saying that, that he was and saying that this was being deceptive and misleading to people. Uh, and I think these are also expressions of, of opinion that are based on these, these stated uh, facts. Um, so I, I don't think it's, it's actionable, but just so to be clear, if you guys haven't read the articles, and, and there's frankly even, even more of them, uh, you know, it, it, it is suggesting that, that uh, uh, he is not being a good actor by saying that he is uh, the inventor of, of email. Uh, I think we had another uh, question or two. So, uh, Kurt, I have a, I guess a form and jurisdiction question about oh boy. California. <laughs> I know, right? Um, one, what are California juries like where this guy is, so where uh, Tech Dirk is having the case? And then the second is, uh, can you get attorney's fees in California uh, if Tector prevails uh, against him? So, uh, so those are those are those are uh, good questions. Um, and let me let me start with the with the second one first. Uh, an advantage of uh, the California anti-slap law is that you can get fees if you are successful. Um, and ordinarily in the uh, American uh, judicial system, uh, each side will bear their own cost. This is called the American rule, contrast from <coughs> the, uh, the UK rule. Uh, you know, our legal system originated from, uh, from uh, uh, jolly old England. Uh, and uh, there the, the, the rule in, in many Commonwealth countries is that um, uh, that the uh, uh, the loser uh, pays uh, just by, by as a matter of course. What this this means is it raises the stake for a lot of litigation. Uh, it, it, it disincentivizes yourself from losing. It also means that you could have pretty high uh, stakes even if you think you're going to win. If it's going to cost you a lot to get there, uh, that uh, you you better be right. Um, so in any event, the, the, the uh, anti-slap law brings that, that fee shifting into play. Uh, I don't know uh, if Massachusetts, where it was filed, uh, has that. So it, it may be that that is part of the reason to have um, uh, uh, to bring into, into the California law. And you know, uh, uh, I know that strategy. I mean, there's a, a, a time uh, uh, when. Uh, uh, EFF, uh, uh, we got sued for uh, writing a, a, a blog post. We have a stupid uh, patent of the month uh, uh, blog, and uh, somebody didn't like their patent being called stupid. Uh, and uh, they, they brought uh, suit, and uh, we were definitely arguing that the California anti slap law would, would, would apply. Uh, it never came to much, and in that case, they, they dropped it um, within days. Uh, but in any event, uh, that's part of it. And then your other question was about California uh, juries, and I, I, I don't uh, I don't know if there if there's a like a notable opinion about whether California juries are better than than Massachusetts juries on on these sorts of uh, uh, points. Um, but one important thing to think about about jury trials is that if you are resource constrained actually having something go before a jury and having it you know probably takes several days to argue in front of the jury that's really expensive uh, and so in, in that sense in a strategic sense if it actually comes down to the point where a jury is hearing something and coming to a decision uh, things have gone badly any more questions there's one over here Sorry, it's similar. It said it was similar to the. Yeah, my question was similar to the other guys were about the attorney fee coverage. I didn't yeah. know anything about that, so we answered that already. All right. There's a question, I think, in the in the second row here. So I've been following Tech Dirt kind of off and on for years, and I'm um, just wondering how how or have the Tech Dirt operations, um, like, are they still? Is it is the site still just operating business as normal, but there's there's this other thing to deal with right now, or has it affected operations? I mean, they they, they have written about this uh, a, a fair amount, uh, and they are still you know the site is operating, mm -hmm. 
there is uh, isupportjournalism.com, which is their site trying to ask for people to, to help support them uh, in, the, uh, in the lawsuit um, through uh, donations. Mm -hmm. um, and, and merchandise. No, oh, yeah. sweet. Um, and, but uh, for day-to-day -day operations, I know that um, since this has happened, uh, whenever I've uh, gone through the, the process with, with pieces of mine, it used to be you know fairly simple and quick and you know be a look over and stuff. Now it's my last piece. Um, it it took a week and a half to go through, and you know you had to get a lot more approval, a lot more looking at it, and I'm not sure about this, not sure about you know having to cross every T, dot every I, and it really slows down the process of news, and it really it gives an intimidatory factor. You're afraid to to go out on a limb somewhat just in case somebody else is in the wings to try and, you know, piggyback on and and, and and split the resources even more with a second suit and, oh, no, we can't afford that, we have to settle this or settle that or, or, or figure out, or, or just give up entirely. And it, so it, it, it's, it's a lot of pressure on that as well. And uh, I think that the, the last piece I did was one on um, lithium batteries and the um, D, uh, Department of Homeland Security decision to that they, all laptops must be... Uh, in the hold, and uh, how that was a bad idea in, in terms of fire, based on a, uh, an incident and in, in thing. Even that was because there was l some supposition, plus some knowledge from my own exa uh, experience with with battery fires, because I'm a, also a robotics engineer or was. Um, so, um, using that basis, it made it. I had a good grounding for myself, but they were worried about. Airlines possibly thinking about it, or the DHS getting upset. Although, being a government agency, many state sla slap laws only apply to state state um, sponsored um, actions. Um, some states are only in uh, kick in when a government agency is doing the thing. If I'm right, am I right? I, I, there, there are yeah, a variety of, of, of anti-slap laws, and some of them are, are too narrow to apply to a more general uh, discussion. I mean, actually, you know, if, if you're, we're talking about if, if it's a TSA thing with the, yeah. uh, you know, you probably have a, a pretty good case that, that a slap law would apply there. But I think I think Massachusetts one on it, it mainly applies to government actors suing and not private entities suing. As in, uh, don't don't happen to know. I I, I, I was kind of glancing and, and trying to uh, while you were talking. But that, that that actually that actually does tie in with what I said earlier the, the 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 chilling effect that it has if it's actually making even if it doesn't mean that we're not going to comment on this particular case or 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 you know if we're not going to report on this particular person the the fact that we're scrutinizing everything that much more um, I, you know there's nothing wrong with the press trying to make sure that their article is right I have no I have no problem with that but if you're going to go to a heightened level of scrutiny scrutiny and 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 really really make every cautious effort to not put out anything that might even be opinion um, you, then you're then you're you're having a chilling effect you're, you're you're not you're not putting out the articles you would put out a month ago uh, you're not putting out the articles you would have put out six months ago and and that means that you're missing some aspect of that journalism yeah, there's a there's uh, what's called pre-pub review is is when you have a pre-publication review is when you have an attorney look over uh, a piece before it gets uh, gets published, uh, and uh, you know uh, attorneys can charge uh, quite a bit per per hour, and uh, uh, this can be uh, a pretty pretty hefty expense if you're doing it over every. Uh, every article. Uh, I don't think actually pre-pub review is necessary for every article. I think most most journalists who've been in the business for a while have a pretty good sense of when they should call somebody in and, and look it over, and when they they uh, know what's uh, what's going on. Uh, but still, that that is something that you have to think about, and it it, it sort of slows down the 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 editorial and, and publication process. Yeah, even if it doesn't cost a penny, it's still slowing it down. You're going right. to be behind on the news. Other people break the story first, and that. It, it's it's but it's still a cost either way. Well, I was going to say that, that like one one of the most sort of dangerous things for freedom of expression that that can come from uh, uh, defamation lawsuits uh, is that 
if you have a, something which you think is in fact true, and you have good evidence to show that it is true, that if the cost of the litigation from the other side who will, who will fight you on that uh, is going to be overwhelming, you might not do a factually true article uh, to to avoid that cost and to, to avoid it being you know the the thing that takes down uh, your your ability to to go forward um, and you know there's ways to mitigate against that you can get um, insurance that would protect against uh, defamation lawsuits but you know that's priced accordingly if you're a uh, you know a major media publication getting uh, that kind of insurance uh, is, is pretty pricey um, and it would be the worst for freedom of expression if truthful statements that are controversial or about people who are particularly religious, uh, litigious, uh, are not being reported. Uh, more, more, more questions. Well, wait for that. Yeah, and you can. Yeah. Uh, when does your organization get involved um, in these cases? Like, what do you guys do to support them? So, um, absolutely, good question. So, uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, so, we are we have a, a number of attorneys, uh, and we do uh, pro bono uh, uh, legal work. That means for free, uh, and uh, uh, we try to do what we what we can. Where we try to get involved uh, is strategically in a, in cases in which uh, we can make a good precedent. So that by establishing that that precedent, we'll be able to have an effect wider than uh, the case at, at hand. Um, and uh, what one of the, the uh, challenges in uh, a defamation time scenario is this this sort of very problem about the facts versus opinion. There can be cases in which. Uh, a determination of what constitutional f free expression uh, uh, law applies will set a, a, an important precedent. And those are the cases where it's, it's about whether it's an opinion and such. If it comes down to whether a fact is true or not, that is something which is not going to have a, a precedential effect on, on other cases. Uh, it's just about that, that particular article, that particular story, and so on. So for, for our, our, our model of uh, trying to have a wider application also means that uh, a, a case where you know, whether something is factually true or not is, is, a, is a core issue isn't, isn't a good case for our, the use of our, our you know, members' uh, donations. Um, and you know, so a, that means that a number of, of, uh, of important uh, uh, cases um, are are not within our, our purview. Um, the other the other uh, thing is that because of this, if uh, you know, we have about uh, seventeen uh, lawyers, which is a you know fair fair number, but we have more requests that come in every day than we could possibly uh, help with. Uh, and if we if we take on a a case that goes to a trial that will take a substantial number of those resources so they wouldn't be available for uh, for other people so we we have occasionally uh, gotten involved into in, in uh, defamation situations but usually where it is a uh, sort of a novel area of uh, uh, First Amendment law so my question kind of piggybacks off of that um, just mostly the idea that this guy claims that he invented email or that he debates this idea, and I guess this is mostly asking for an opinion since, you know, that's kind of what this base is on. I don't want to have anybody stating any facts, but, <coughs> I mean, you, you mentioned earlier about him not acting in good faith. I mean, how common is it that people will, like, really be reaching on something like what, uh, like a basis of evidence? Most people would consider invented email invented what most people think of as email so how often do things like that happen where this guy is like oh well you know i invented email and he has to put air quotes around it because it's technically correct well, he but just not like he didn't he doesn't put air quotes around it he he defines email as what he created and then he defines it as that and then everybody else piggybacked off him and learned from him well he said that's that wasn't actually email he said because it didn't use this exact system that he's got that he defines as email 
And then he points to a copyright registration he made for his program in 1982, and he says, because you can't get trademark on it, and they didn't allow patents at the time, copyright was the only way to get government to recognize it. And he said, and he puts that in all his material that it's recognized by the US government as him being the first to invent it through a copyright registration in 1982. That, that's how he, he spins it, that he invented email, that's E-M-E, E-M-A-I-L, um, no spaces, no hyphens, no nothing, just those five characters through the virtue of his copyright registration in 82, because that was the only way using um, the, the dreaded term intellectual property laws that the government could recognize what he created at that point. That, that's his argument. So, and, and I think to the question, the, the plenty of people stretch the truth about what they've done. I mean, I, I read resumes all, all the time that, that maybe uh, exaggerate a little bit about the successes people have had at their previous jobs. But you want, you want to see that? Look at my bio. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the, the difference here and what made it a, what made it worthy of comment in, in, in journalism and what is now um, worthy of litigation um, is that this isn't just somebody puffing their own reputation to, to, to you know, look better in a, in a certain instance. He's built an entire career out of being the inventor of email, not, not because he's getting any money for his email program, not because he's selling his software, um, but because he's writing books and doing speaking tours and, and, and selling branding supplements. Himself, yeah, branding himself as the inventor of email. At, at inventoremail.com, I believe his, yeah. his website is. <laughs> so, so that's the, that, that's what made it a, a, a bigger deal is that it's not just me maybe inflating my successes to you. Uh, it, 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 it was holding himself out to the public at large and, and, and brandishing this. I would say the, the other thing that, that really made this uh, a, a notable case or an important uh, uh, case is that you know, it was a $15 million claim damages lawsuit that you know, if it were successful would be the end of a, you know, a, a prominent uh, uh, blog uh, that you know, the, the stakes were very high and then also coupling that with how uh, the same attorney had sued another prominent publication and had successfully brought it down. Uh, I mean, honestly, that's that's what brought it to to my attention. Uh, up until that point, I actually hadn't heard of uh, uh, his his claims in, in, until the Gawker uh, lawsuit sort of made it made it more prominent. And it should be also noted that um, Shiva has um, somewhat of a flair for, for promotion as well. I mean, um, un until recently, he was married to Fran Drescher, formerly of the Nanny, uh, TV show The Nanny. Um, they were married for three or four years, and as I say now he's going for the Senate run um, on a on a Trump platform uh, to again to to boost his brand because he's, it's it's all about his brand, and he's done Reddit Amers with um, or AMAs you want it, with, at, at the Donald, and uh, that was not pleasant to uh, to, to to read. Um, a lot of um, I'm not I don't think Kurt took part, but I know. Adam Steinberg um, and a few others uh, took part, and uh, when we asked questions, it, it, we, were, we were block kicked, and uh, people started stalking us. Uh, he has some things, but he has a, a victim complex about certain things because he believes that um, his Indian caste, was, which is a low one, is is what causes it. Um, we got. Yeah, we have about eight, eight minutes left. Yeah, uh, so one question. One question. Then. Maybe so unnecessary already, but since email is considered like a generic term these days, is there any chance to get the trademark overturned? There, there is no trademark. It's a, oh. It was a copyright. A cop well, even with so, that? No. So uh, a copyright uh, is, is about expression. So, you know, you can't copyright an idea. Uh, it, it is not about functionality. It is about expression. So it's t designed to be for creativity, uh, and uh, uh, if if I wrote a copyrighted computer program, 
and uh, got a registration on it. And then you wrote another program that did the exact same thing. You could get a registration on it because uh, your your way of writing it is is likely to be different from mine. And even if you happen to write it the sort of the same way that I wrote it, if you hadn't actually seen mine, uh, then uh, you know you would not be infringing upon it because you don't have the element of copying. Uh, so it, it it is sort of a, a it's designed you know for for authors, uh, you, know, you copyright books, you copyright movies. Uh, ten cards would be a prime example um, on this. Katech is not copyrightable because it's, it's a name, it's a short thing to descriptive. The overall design is copyrighted to Scott because he owns the copyright because he did the design. The signage department here at DragonCon makes other ten cards which may also contain Katech and may also contain several other things but it's a separate independent design and so therefore wouldn't be infringing on his copyright because he has the design but not the contents so the that's that's so the difference and with, with that in mind like there, i don't think there's there's a problem with his copyright you can get a copyright uh the copyright in, in on the code of his just, program you know, yeah so even if it took him 30 seconds he can still copyright it you mm -hmm. could scribble on a piece of paper and have a copyright in that beautiful piece of art mm -hmm. and, and and send it in and w not only that um Registration is a formality that is not necessary. Uh, this this is kind of weird because it, it came. There was a time in which you had to actually get a registration for you know. Seventy four, right? Uh, I think it was in the in the seventy six act. Seventy six, uh, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, in any event, uh, um, they got rid of formalities because there were like too many problems where uh, somebody had like forgot to put a copyright notice in a in a book or whatever and then lost the copyright and yada yada. Didn't you. Uh, and then we move forward into a time period in which you are sort of like creating copyrighted works like all day long with everything you do, like every email you write is a copyrighted work that you have made and, and so on. Uh, and th this is this has sort of caused uh, weirdnesses. Uh, but but be that as it may, uh, a registration is uh, is basically an acknowledgement uh, that you have filled out the form and, and, and sent it in. The reason that you would register, uh, one is that if you do sue and you have a registered copyright, you can get more damages than you could if you don't. It, it's a prerequisite to actually filing suit, so you, you would have to do it before you, you actually litigate it over, over someone copying your material. So it's it, you know it's a useful thing, but it's not necessary. You probably would only want to go and register things that you cared particularly about. Uh, but it is commonplace for for people to copyright uh, uh, software programs, um, books, books. Yeah, well, books are much much more common than, than software. Um, so, like uh, anyway, there, there's nothing particularly strange or or. or uh, uh, Bad about registering a copyright in a software program, though I think also you know not one shouldn't make that out for more than it is. Right? Yeah, it, it's just an expression of it, and that's all. Yeah, As we only got a in the, in the back. Mm -hmm. yeah, so right, so it, we, we it's recorded, so without the mic, it doesn't pick up on the recording. Fair enough. Um, so kind of piggybacking off of that, as far as copyright, trademark, patented. Um, in your opinion, would you say that the argument that his copyright of email, like whatever it is that he did that he called email, really factually matters like to the idea of email, or would you need to have that under something more like uh, rigorous, like a patent, or I mean, does if copyright you cover wanted that? to g So uh, just so I guess to briefly go through the, the, the three main forms of intellectual property, as they say. Uh, so patent is about uh, uh, ideas, basically, about you know inventions. Uh, and so it's not about the, the expression. It's about the sort of the w what the thing does or, um, you know, or, or uh, m sorry? Yeah, I mean, th th that could be part of it. You could also have, a, like, design patents. Um, and the corners, and the, the sort of the, the notion is that if you have a a patent on some sort of you know method of doing things, you know you uh, invent a uh, perpetual motion machine, uh, then uh, you know you would want to get a patent on that because you know people would be really interested in making a perpetual motion machine. 
By the way, that is, I think, the one thing that the patent office requires you to have a working sample of before they will consider your patent application. They get a lot of perpetual motion machine applications. and I think that's <coughs> a recent addition, though, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and uh, patents last for a relatively short period of time, uh, sort of 20 ish years. I'm not a patent expert, so you know this is like plus. Or well, then there's like the. You, you it, it depends, first of all, on all that stuff, so yeah. Um, versus a copyright, which is uh, currently life of the author plus 70 years. Uh, and so like a very, very long time. Uh, or if you're a corporation, that's 95 uh, years. And uh, uh, we'll find out uh, if that if that lasts. The last time Disney's important copyrights like Mickey Mouse were coming up for going into the public domain, they got a 20-year extension on how long copyrights last. And that was 19 years ago. Oh, uh, right, so it's coming up soon. So it may be that Mickey Mouse will go into the public domain. Uh, or not. Or maybe out. we have another extension. Uh, and then finally, trademark, which is actually... Uh, that's a consumer protection uh, statute. It's so that if you you know go uh, and uh, you know order a, a, a particular product, you, know, you you go to a store and ask for an iPhone, that they give you the Apple iPhone and, and not an Android. And if somebody puts an Android and s writes iPhone on it, then they are violating the the, uh, the trademark. Though ironically, Apple didn't own the trademark to iPhone when it launched the product and called it iPhone. The Chinese company. Uh, Cisco. Oh yes, Cisco with that with that. Um, and video they phones. had been negotiating apparently, and like it was taking a while to do the negotiations. They're like, ah, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, when when uh, I guess uh, uh, that's something that uh, not recommended from the legal point of view, but uh, they did. To put, it, to put it another way, though, in simple terms, patent is the idea of having a water bottle. Uh, copyright is the design of the water bottle, and trademark is the patent on the label that tells you who the brand is. That's a, that's a simple. Hmm? The name of it. Yeah, the name of the label and and the design. You know, but that but that's why it's important to recognize the 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 claim for what it is. So the copyright, it, again, there's nothing wrong with the copyright. It's probably perfectly legitimately copyrighted. It's his it's his legitimately unique expression of his email program. But well, it does not it, it does not necessarily convey any idea that. His is the first or only email program. There, y y y there can be multiple, multiple, multiple copyrights of the same idea. There can be there can be many, many ways of expressing the same, the same concept. And uh, you know, wh while these, uh, you know, the, the 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 Romeo and Juliet story obviously is not copyrighted, but that that idea. How many how many different star-crossed lovers stories? can be written and each and every one of them is independently copyrighted but it doesn't mean that any one of them was the inventor of that concept so it's it's taking it's taking the the registration and giving it some his his his, his it, assertion it it that this is that this is the government saying that I have definitively invented email is taking that registration and stretching its actual proof to insignificance to a to a bit more broad extent. I think which has got to be the uh, last question because we've come to uh, eleven o'clock. So he's trying to use copyright as if it's a patent, basically. He's I mean, I is you know, uh, in the court of public opinion, certainly to 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 run down the, the run through the courts mm -hmm. and to. And to Outspend because he's just got seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars from the Gorka settlement. I mean, and just to like it, a lot of it, I think does come down to this: what is is email, and the if you take his view that the thing that he wrote is email, and then the fact that that it got registered, it just is like a timestamp. It shows like this, like this did happen. Here is a copy of the program. So you don't you don't like if. Uh, if somebody said that they invented email and they just pulled out this old floppy disk, found a computer that would accept a floppy disk and, and looked at it and there was something that was called email on it, it wouldn't seem as, as impressive. You're like, well, did you just make that up? Did you write this you know, disk more modern, uh, you know, more, more recently and then change the date on it? So, I mean, th there is sort of an advantage to having a, a timestamp on when it happened, but it, it doesn't change from the core issue that seems to be going on here is what is, what do we mean by email? 
and do we mean the thing that he wrote is email and therefore he is the inventor of email or do we mean by email something else which is the messaging system that existed prior to that that have evolved later and and, and what it, what it is and i think what you know tech dirt's uh, position uh, and others is that uh what he did is not properly considered to be email and their that in their constitutionally protected opinion and i think he he is disputing that and saying that that is a factual matter uh, and and to that end, you know the the, the registration is like a minor minor point, I think, uh, uh, along the along the way. All right, we've gone uh, actually a little bit over time, so uh, thank you everybody for for coming out. Uh, Sunday, Sunday morning. morning and not going to see William Shatner or whoever else.